All right, guys. We're ready for our Four Seasons sunroom, and Daddy's going to get a rec room with refreshments. Oh, no. We'll be sleeping under the stars. Mom, what about the one with, you know, the fun? Nice try, little bro. It's a gym. My gym. Hey, Grandma's getting her Four Seasons garden room. Weather tight and still like being outdoors. Maybe a living room. Oh, no. Wait. A family hub. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what the budget, the season, or the climate, Four Seasons Sunrooms let you and your family enjoy the outdoors inside. Call now to receive your free, no-obligation brochure from the premier manufacturer of sunrooms since 1975. More reasons for Four Seasons Now. To find out more, call toll-free 800-928-7007. That's 800-928-7007. Call 800-928-7007 today. Wake up, America. I think I got something to say to you. I love the United States of America. And I want you to love the United States of America, too. Wake Up America Radio with Dr. A and Lubell is not a safe space, so enter at your own risk. You will be exposed to the truth, and we will endure the consequences. Now rest assured, Dr. A will not try to put his brain into your head. I will, however, motivate you to think and to use the analytical part of your brain that very few people want to use because it requires actual effort and actual work. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up America Radio. Lou, i got to tell you. Tell Dr. me. A took a, <laughs> Dr. A took a virtual beating in the K98 chat room today. Excellent. Uh, Bloody Marys and broadsheets. <laughs> I, I was just innocently offering my sage political advice and analysis. Innocently. And what happened? Bad Juju and Miss Stacy vehemently attacked me for it. And now, folks... Offline, when she that was, was giving... not a vehement attack. They gave but, you back. I'm sure what you were giving them in the chat room. You, you, if you're going to you, behave you. that way in the chat room, you've got to expect for them to call you out on the air. That's the way their show works. You see, you always run interference for your, <laughs> your, your little buddy there from the uh, North Georgia studios, the Cornell, the Cornell chick. But mm-hmm. and you know what, folks? Offline, when Lubell, who you all love was giving me the bum's rush today to get our show done. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm beside myself. Oh, dear, you poor thing. It's just well, nothing like having to scramble jets off of a carrier, is it? No, it's, it's, no. A, it's a similar dynamic, but not quite like that. You know what, this, uh, uh, this uh, last week, in fact, it was just the other day, um, people asked me this question, Lou. They wonder why does it seem as though... Barack Hussein Obama, our current occupant in the White House and, and president and chief executive, why does it seem that he hates the United States? And here, here was the succinct, succinct and astute answer that I gave to this question. Barack Hussein Obama is an Islamo-communist. Therefore, he has two reasons to hate all of Western society. All communists hate the United States of America. All Muslims hate the United States of America. I'm sorry, but it is true. He threatened the UK wanna, this week. Well, if you want to learn about that, please feel free to read my latest book, Politics in America, Lecture Notes of a Lunatic Professor, and perhaps you might be able to save, be saved from your thoroughly mind-raped brain. And that's kind of like my, uh, my opening statement there. Um, you know what, Lou? We are in the middle of... Uh, a long series about uh, communism and cultural Marxism. And I think it's important that we've, we're doing this to educate the audience because it's what's been happening. I think you said it on the last show, uh, it's been going on since, I will tell you, since 1919 when Lenin first invented this stuff. Uh, but you said it's, it's been going on for the last 50 years in earnest. And, and that was such an astute statement from you. It really has been going on for the last 50 years um, in earnest, if you will. So uh, let's see what we can get through here today on this uh, particular broadcast. 
Uh, this, this portion of our series is entitled The New Communist Man. And you know what, Lou? No systematic examination of politics and societal relations can be productive unless it is based on an attempt to fully understand um, human nature and fully understand the behavioral motivations that compel man, and by man I mean man and woman, to act. Now, although somewhat archaic in this uh, 21st century era of self-identifying social constructs and smartphone selfies, Greek philosopher Plato's unique perception of the intricacy of human nature, you know what, Lou, that remains quite extraordinary. This is perhaps the primary reason that the ancient Athenian theorists continues to have such a strong impact on Western political thought precisely because his explanation of politics and political behavior uh, in our societies is grounded on a theory of man's fundamental nature. I might have mentioned this last week, but it doesn't matter what class I teach in universities. I have all of my students read uh, something written by Plato uh, all the time. Because it's it's just it's fundamental. It's, it's so important. All right. So, have you ever read Plato? Of course, I read. I was a political science major. You know, I read Plato. I, I you know, I'm, I'm gaining more respect for Meredith College. You about should day, have respect for Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> well, the uh, social relations and the political dilemmas they uh, how should I put this typically engender must never be studied or managed. Uh, in a state of segregation. At their core, political problems are human conundrums, uh, permeated with all the rational, irrational, and conflicting components that are intermingled in a web of human existence. I wrote that. Was that was that too intellectual? Can people understand that? I mean, of course. I, I, Our I, audience I, is smart, remember? Well, I know they are. The, the, the three in the uh, romper room, K98, are very smart. But um, Our entire audience is smart. We have the smartest right. audience in radio. I hope, I hope we get some of these low-information uh, voters that listen to us. Come back. That's you know one of the purposes of... of well, you better dumb it down this. a little then. Huh? <laughs> you better I, dumb I, I it down a little. I want to properly educate people. Maybe we can save somebody. Who knows? Who knows? Um, now, Lynch, taming... And uh, domesticating man's unreasonable forces and channeling them into socially desirable demeanor is and should be an overarching goal of political science research and political science analysis. As such, the manner in which a nation state could best achieve freedom, security, order, strength, and cohesion from a proper ordering of society. That was the undergirding question of most social con contract political philosophers when we started writing back in those days. Now, to make a little segue here, in the field of psychoanalysis, we all are familiar with Dr. Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud explained man's behavior in modern civilization as emanating from two basic categories of motivation. The first one he called the Eros instinct. This is man's natural impulse to love and cooperate, despite the uh, non-love I was getting today in the romper room. And the second one is called the death instinct, and that's man's natural impulse to attack and destroy. We, we all, according to Dr. Freud, we all have those two natural instincts in our basic chemistry as human beings. Modern civilization, if you will, arose out of the chaotic state of nature because man eventually learned the value of sort of redirecting his narrow love of family into a broader allegiance for first the group, then the community, then the society, and finally the state. And now in that regards, I mean state both as the state within which we reside and then the larger macro concept of the nation state. 
And yet this redirects of love by man tends to be simultaneously productive of the type of um, disappointment and hostility, if you will, that tend to reinforce the aggressive instincts of human nature. That being the case, the march of civilized society is a relentless battle between the collective and the hostile compulsions of human beings in mankind. Lou Freud argues that this natural, all-encompassing conflict in social relations and the um, frustrations that it creates, what does that do? It compels human beings to adopt antagonistic viewpoints, not only to others, but antagonistic view viewpoints to themselves. Now, in the manifesto, Karl Marx argued that abolishing private property would indeed eliminate personal and collective aggressions because there would be no need for oppression and alienation once we were all living within a communist utopia. But in any nation where a pseudo-Marxist revolution has succeeded in taking, taking hold, at least temporarily, a reign of socialist tranquility, which I'm sure Bernie Sanders would love to talk about, a reign of socialist tranquility has never been realized, Lou. In fact, persecution of the conquered people in that society by Lenin's professional communist revolutionaries further motivated these so-called political elites to direct their onslaught against not only their nation, their own people, but the entire world. Thus, that was in keeping with the, the Marxist blueprint that, that he taught them. Now, to reiterate, Freud stipulates that cultural evolution cannot be fully controlled because of the constant struggle between those competing uh, instinctual forces of love and death. And that these uh, sort of uh, psychologic, psychological, psychoanalytical models or paradigms are indeed the primary instigators of our behavior as human beings. But you know what, Lou, in the minds of many communist philosophers, if this uh, natural struggle, this natural battle between rival behavioral stimuli could be eliminated through what they call human re-engineering, if they could successfully do that, Lou, a loving, cooperative, socialist utopia would eventually be established and encompass the entire world all over this uh, wonderful sphere that we're living on. Well, that's really interesting because I've never seen anything that looked both socialist and loving at the same time. Well, uh, when they are out of power, they're very loving. But once they get behind the business end of the rifles and the guns, that's when they change. Really? That's when, they, that's when you really? find when was out the who last they time? Really Okay, are. so I'm going to challenge you on that one, Doc. When was the last time that you saw a um, socialist protest and a single person in the crowd seem loving? N not necessarily the, uh, the Soros-paid activists that we see every day today in the United States, but I'm talking about the so-called elites who are up there on on the the mantle, giving their There's little speeches like like Lennon and Bernie and, and, and what's her name, Mrs. Clinton. There's they they sometimes seem to be loving. Seem don't they? to be. They seem to be. But there's yeah. a difference between being loving and acting loving. Right, and we know that. Yes. But you got to realize that the people that are have been mind raped or are in the process of becoming indoctrinated, they don't realize that. They you know what they they desperately want to believe what they're being told, Lou. That's your first mistake. Do not desperately want to, to believe what you're being told. Find, I used to teach this to my students all the time. Don't even believe anything that comes out of this mouth, people. And I point to my, my, my own mouth during class. Find out on your own. Do the requisite amount of research and find out if I'm telling you the truth or not. And it's like Maybe you say I'm in the intro, that you. takes work. Well, of course, nobody wants to do that, but you have to. We, we, I mentioned that in the romp room today. You've got to do that on your own, uh, lest you be indoctrinated, brainwashed, and mind raped. You know, become part of a cult. 
Right. That, that's what that's what's happened. It's no different than what happened in Jonestown with that knucklehead down there that convinced those people to take the cyanide. Thus the metaphor, drink the Kool-Aid. It is, drinking the Kool-Aid. And we're going to talk about that as we move forward in this, this series on cultural Marxism when we get to the, the part where we talk about the virtual gulag. Most people don't even realize they are in a gulag, virtual though it might be. They're in prison already. They don't even know it. And that's why we're doing this. We're trying to break people out of that prison, break people out of that communist prison so that they can live free lives. You never realize that you've lost a right until you try to exercise it, and it's no longer there. You you don't realize what you've lost until it's gone. Exactly. Until you try to exercise it, until you actually try to use it, until you speak and the government doesn't like what you said, and they put you in prison for it, like the guy who made the video that they blamed Benghazi for. here's Here's the deal. Don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you've lost till it's gone, and then they pave paradise and put up a parking lot. That well, was with my, no, my, my Joni was, Mitchell in the sixties. That's a great analogy. No, it's not till it's gone. It can be gone and you not realize it. It could be gone for a long time exactly. and you not realize exactly. it and, until and it you try to gone. exercise and, and it in a way that they don't like. All these people, right? Exactly. It's already gone. Um. It's been gone. This, this uh, social reengineering, human reengineering, this is the undergirding principle in the concept known as the new communist man, social reengineering. And it fuels cultural Marxism and political correctness today in the enlightened, so called enlightened world. I argue that all human behavior is motivated by need, Lou not by primitive instincts, as Dr. Freud postulates. In reality, human behavior... Are you there? Yep. I thought I lost you. In reality, all human behavior is motivated by need, not primitive instincts, as Freud teaches. In reality, human behavior follows Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs to the letter of his theory. Maslow's hierarchy implies that human beings are prompted to satisfy uh, the basic needs, if you will, before they can progress to other more complex uh, requirements. Uh, Maslow, if you don't know, was a humanist psychologist who firmly believed that man has an inborn desire to be what he calls self-actualized and uh, to eventually be all that he can be, uh, as the uh, U.S. Army commercials always say when they're trying to recruit kids to come into the Army. But in order to achieve this uh, sort of pinnacle goal, a number of the more basic needs must first be satiated. Um, Rudimentary necessities such as food, safety, love, of which I didn't get much of today, uh, and self-esteem. I, you know, I, every, it doesn't matter whether you're there or not, Lou. I don't get this in the chat room. Everybody in the chat room loves Lou Bell. If you're there, they love on you. If you're not there, they love on you. And I, I have to defend myself. How, why is that the case, Lou? Because I'm sweet. <laughs> Actually, I'm mean, but I make people think that I'm sweet. See, I am like a socialist. Oh, dear. And you know no, what? No, we no, got to no. we ha- wrap it up. We got to go to a break real quick. Okay. Sounds good to me. Um well, let's go to the break, and I'll come back, and, and uh, I'll talk about Maslow's uh, theory and, and what, what his pyramid looks like. If you want to take a break right now, I can, I'm ready. Okay, we'll take a break, and we'll be right back. Join us Tuesday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern, for Game On. Remember, lock up the children and the old folks. Game On, the home of libertarian conservatives. 
where no one is safe, no one is spared, not even the hosts. Oh, like that was supposed to be a spin, spin cycle. cycle. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. We love you anyway. Right round, baby. Self monitoring right round. Ebola anyway. radio strikes again. <laughs> anyway. Anybody uh, see the host monkey? Today. Where's the host monkey? Where's the host monkey? For God's sake, I need an antidote. Just anyway, do your rhythm. Let's pop out of the second. <laughs> Find us on Twitter at JD and Stacy. You're listening to K98talk.com. I've seen this happen before. There's a full moon out tonight. I'm a fool, but you can't fool me twice. I wear my secret deception just like a disguise. Goodbye. I knew that this wouldn't be easy. Try not to tie it down. Now nothing you say can appease me. If you wanted to go, then you would have been gone before now. The A darkness abounds. All right, welcome back from uh, the break, there, people. Let's continue here with uh, The New Communist Man, uh, our exploration of, uh, you know, cultural Marxism. Now, Maslow's Pyramid, uh, it's called a Pyramid of Need, Hierarchy of Need. That pyramid depiction of his basic thesis starts with those fundamental needs that are situated at the bottom of that psychological paradigm. And then it progresses upward to the top, where the highest human uh, necessities of all are located. Again, physiological essentials of primitive survival like air, food, water, and sleep, which we all need, obviously, that represents the foundation of this pyramid. We all need those. Next up, after we get those uh, needs taken care of, uh, next up are the security needs like safety, shelter, employment, health care although there's 95 million people, dude, that do not have employment, thanks to uh, Barack Hussein Obama and his uh, public policies. Followed uh, up the chain of this uh, hierarchy of need uh, are the social needs. We all have social needs. Uh, needs of belonging, need for love, need for affection. Esteem needs in this... Uh, pyramid are things like accomplishment, individual value, uh, and social recognition. That's the fourth plateau in this hierarchy, leading upward to the peak demands, which are the self-actualization desires of mankind that, that we all have. The apex of Maslow's pyramid is the point in human existence where people are, how should we put this, self-aware and people are secure enough in their lower cravings, having been met, that they can now safely, listen to what I said, safely pursue things like personal growth and fulfilling their human destiny. Dr. Arrington, Dr. A, as Miss Stacy likes to call me, <laughs> you know what, today, you know what she kept calling me in the romper room, Lou? She was so condescending to me, she called me Randy. Why would she not call you Randy? And that's I thought everybody called me Dr. Ray. She called me Randy. She was condescending to me. How is calling <laughs> you by your first name condescending? That's familiar. Is it is it condescending when I call Hillary Clinton Mrs. Clinton? It's simultaneously condescending and respectful. Well, no, you call her that. You call her that intentionally to be condescending. I do, but so it's also if, if Stacy calls you Doctor A, maybe that's condescending in calling you Randy is being uh, nice and familiar. She's, she's being friendly to me. I know. Okay, I have exactly. sat across the table from her. Yeah, and, and maybe, shut my mouth and as maybe I she calls you Randy when she's trying to keep. From slapping you around a little bit, <laughs> okay, she might uh, call you Randy continue. when she'd really like to be throat punching you. I love her and I love bad juju as well. <laughs> you know that. Okay, so let's continue. Randy teaches that all human behavior is motivated by need. Let's give us some examples. 
I'm going to Disney World in a couple weeks. I drink water from a water fountain at Disney World. Why? Because I'm thirsty. I take a class or two at a community college, local community college, so that I can eventually find a good job, make money, and buy bottled water and feed myself. I hand you a bouquet of fresh flowers. This would be a woman, by the way. I am a hetero. I hand you a bouquet of fresh flowers so that you might develop affection for me. Then perhaps we can get together, raise a family, for which we, the two of us as a couple, will keep a roof over their heads and food on their table. I don't donate money to a local charity. Why? In order to be formally recognized by my community as a philanthropist, as a good guy. I teach at a university and write scholarly books and articles so that I can grow as a human being and pass on traditional cherished values like freedom, patriotism, true patriotism, and the real truth to others, thus enabling people to reach their highest individual potential. Now, you know what, Lou? Unfortunately, there are men and women in our nation who satisfy their needs in a more, in a more nefarious manner. For instance, I knock you out with a hammer so that I can steal your wallet and buy myself dinner with your money. Or I decide to sell illegal narcotics on the street so that I can pay the rent on my huge townhouse. I joined the Bloods street gang in Los Angeles because my single mother abandoned me at age 12 or 13. I become a professional agitator protesting at hot spots around America, all around America, because of my need to be recognized as a social justice fighter for oppressed people. Social justice warrior. Yeah, uh, economic justice, whatever those, those words mean. Mm-hmm. Um, I use, those are politically correct, by the way, mm-hmm. I use the mind rape tactics of cultural Marxism to human re-engineer a new communist man and foment the eventual socialist revolution. You know what, Lou, if a professional revolutionary can successfully, can successfully reprogram your mind and reprogram your body, he or she can control and manipulate your behavior. Not a good situation. This premise, Wench, is at the heart of cultural Marxism and the political correctness war being waged on weak minded individuals in contemporary America today, or as you, you taught us last week, in earnest for the last 50 years inside the United States of America. Political correctness as a clandestine tactic of cultural Marxism seeks to eradicate dissent. It seeks to generate homogeneity of thought, of attitude, and of demeanor in all Americans. And for the record, I said it had been at least 100 years. I should listen to I should listen to the show once we do it. <laughs> or as I we're think doing it's it. been a century. Yeah, I think it's easy been easily been. You're, a century. you're right. It's, it's true. Now, as such, it is indeed totalitarian at its very very core, because the objective is the inevitability of communist domination, uh, permeating and penetrating deeply into the culture and character, which was mentioned today in the Rampa Room, the character of men and women. Cultural Marxism attempts to absorb individuals, then recast them as a new creature, not a new creature in the image of Marxist dogma. As I was, as I was saying that uh, during the show, I thought about ca- characterizing cultural Marxism as a blob. Remember the movie The Blob? Sort of. Yeah, and the blob starts coming, and it just it grabs people and just it just invades them and envelops them and takes over their body and right. absorbs them into that blob, and then they no longer uh, are alive, at least in the normal sense of what they were alive. And it grows uh, as it does so. It, exactly, and that's what's it's happening right now. Cultural Marxism is a blob. I yep. like that. We just thought we just thought of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cultural Marxism uh, again attempts to absorb everybody, like the blob and uh, create a new creature in the image of Marxist dogma. As, as There's, a, there's a, a book out there called The Communist Man. It's actually by Mikhail Heller. This new 
altruistic communist man would be what? Would be sacrificial to the common good in his labor activities. This new communist man would have a collective outlook on life in general and be boundless in their desire for worldwide revolution. Therefore, all social norms and cultural institutions of liberal democracy must be obliterated. Why? Because they insulate individuals. They form a barrier. They insulate the individuals from experiencing the assault of alienation, rendering them with a false consciousness with regard to Marx's classic class struggle. To produce this contrived level of conscience in the new communist man, the old attitudes, Lou, had to be systematically chipped away at, leaving people socially uh, and culturally unprotected from that blob, utterly defenseless, and thus receptive to the human reengineering process. Please don't ever be receptive, folks, to the human reengineering process. Cultural Marxists, when this occurs, could then utilize their vast arsenal of propaganda tools to complete the process of creating socialist zombies, sort of a communist walking dead, Lou, if you will. What do you think of that so far? A communist walking dead. Yeah, and it's it's very. Um, I I think it's it, it's very appropriate because it's it is like a virus, and they get in your head. But you know what? As you were talking about offline, there intimidation and extreme brutal violence, folks, mm-hmm. are likewise a vital component of the mind rape that is communist brainwashing. Right. And and we've we had a show about this uh, several months ago. Islam uses the same heinous, brutal strategies and tactics to manipulate its adherents as well as intimidate the infidels. Well, and you know the ph- philosophical writings better than I do, so I'm going to ask you a question. Oh no! Okay, I'm prepared this for this. This is part of my role on the show, right? Okay. So, yes, ma'am. I've, it's always kind of been my theory. I've been thinking about for a while. Was, is is that really where the uh, communists pick it, picked it up from? Uh, and throughout history, people have used, and leaders have used violence to brainwash and intimidate and control people. And, you know, uh, from the Vikings to the Huns to... So, I mean, did the communists just, just carried that through into their ideology, No. Well, yeah, that's very astute analysis. And the Islamic version of it has been around, again, for centuries. Fear, we're talking about human nature, folks. Fear is a tremendous motivator. Even the Lord God himself instills fear in his creation. I mean, he he wiped out the entire planet uh, when he constructed Noah to build that ark and gave two of each kind and put his family in there and start over again. He turned people into pillars of salt. When they, you know, look look back, he told you not to look back. Fear is a tremendous motivator, Lou. That's why torture works. Yeah. Um, this newly interpreted version, if you will, of Marxism, uh, it views the dominant political culture of society as the primary catalyst of the eventual class struggle, not the uh, oppressive economic conditions that they were enduring. This uh, innovative interpretation was was adopted and honed by cultural Marxists like Antonio Gramsci, Lukacs, and uh, Herbert Marcuse, because workers of the world did not rise up and unite and bring about the proletarian revolution as Karl Marx had first predicted would occur. Poor leadership, Christianity, liberal democracy, workers' rights, and false consciousness were ultimately blamed by the so-called academics for this failure, Uh, not the obvious flaws contained in Marxist philosophy and socialism itself. That being the case, cultural Marxists devised a cleverly reinterpreted theory of communist revolution, focusing their efforts on subverting culture, 
focusing their efforts on subverting individual character. As such, the dominant culture of America had to be effectively abolished and replaced with a dominant socialist culture. That's happening right now, Lou. And as the, I always teach my classes that political culture is the glue that holds any society together, the ultimate glue that holds any society together. If that glue that holds any society together, if that dominant culture can be perverted in favor of Marxism, the economic base would naturally crumble. And that's what they have reinterpreted Marxist theory to be today. Cultural, cultural Marxists actively attempt to manipulate man's thought process using constant bombardment. So before you go before you go too much further with that, with regards to the economic base, would that mean that any anyone in our government now with socialist leanings that were trying to reach that end of a socialist society in America, could they be undermining our economic system on purpose? Absolutely. That's exactly what's happening. If you can convince mind rate people into behaving the way you want them to behave. In other words, behaving in a with, with a cultural Marxist supremacy as their underlying source of motivation, uh, you can completely destroy the economic system. Barack Hussein Obama is doing that right now on purpose using Saul Alinsky tactics, uh, who another one of these cultural, uh, cultural Marxists using mind rape tactics to destroy America. And if you can get 95 million people out of the workforce and dependent on the government for their very existence, you are chipping away and successfully destroying the economic base because eventually you run out of other people's money. And eventually, keeping in mind that they're doing this to solidify their own power. It is about their power. It's, exactly. And Marxism, socialism, communism is not for the people. I mean, pardon me, it's not for the people that run it, the, the professional revolutionaries. It's for the people in the much-hated, disgusting, unwashed masses, which you and I are in. It's, it's, for, it's for us. It's not for them. They live this rare, in this rarefied air. Once the socialist nation takes over, socialist philosophy takes over, they don't succumb to that. They're up there in the rarefied air shopping at their own little stores, that are fully stocked with bread and all the stuff that they need, they need, the essentials, where you and I would have to stand in line to get our one loaf of bread, and the moms would have to stand in line for their one package, maybe a half a package of diapers. It is a disgusting environment. C- communism, folks, trust Dr. Ray on this one subject, never works. Never. It only is partially successful for a limited period of time while they have you at the the pointy end, the business end of their guns, and they scare you, like Lou was saying earlier. They make you succumb to their desired behavior with fear and destruction so that you just shut up and stand in line. That's what they do, Lou, and you know that. Yes, I do know that. In, in today's environment, the primary targets of communist infiltration uh, using that political correctness arsenal that they have at their disposal, disposal the, pol- the primary targets in America are conservatism, family lineage, and heredity, education, the system, capitalism, social justice, sexual restraint, in other words, relieving the restraints of sexual behavior. Media, the establishment, political institutions, patriotism, police, national loyalty, the military, university students, alienated groups, asocial groups, poor blacks. You know what, Lou, from this cultural hegemony, a fresh consciousness and a new communist man would be created and be ripe for Marxist revolution. And on that note, why don't we take a break, Lou? You know what? That's a great idea. It's time for a break, Doc. We'll take a quick one, and we will be right back. I looked all over, so how can it be? Here comes the wrecking ball.
K98Talk is continuing to expand its lineup. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. Okay, folks, here is uh, Dr. Ray's final analysis. The very nature of political correctness and the cultural Marxist message of sensitivity, uh, diversity, and tolerance are tantamount to snake oil salesmen of the old West days. Don't let communist infiltrators rape your mind, people. Resist them. Resist the blob, if you will. Don't buy their repackaged bottle of Marxist oil. Mr. Obama is a communist community organizer in the, in the mold of Vladimir Lenin, as, as we were talked about earlier in Lenin, uh, creating this stuff, as Lou said, 100 years ago. Mrs. Clinton is a radical Marxist whose mind was raped by Saul Alinsky, Bruce Jenner is not a woman. Rachel Dolezal is not an oppressed black female. Don't be fooled by this stuff, people. Think for yourselves, which was mentioned today on J.D. and Stacy's uh, wonderful show that I listened to, uh, Bloody Marys and Broad Sheets. You know what, Lou? That's the, sort of the end of uh, this uh, segment, if you will, for our broadcast on cultural Marxism. We'll, we'll get to the virtual gulag next week. But as I understand it, people, Wench Lubell has some uh, breaking news that she wants to bring up and, uh, and mention to the, the people in the audience. So, Lou, what have you got for us? Well, it's something really interesting um, that I've watched develop on Twitter with um, one of the jihad fighting ghosts. And uh, this is a, a lone ghost called Wachula Ghost, who is um, had been around for, you know, since the beginning of Op, Op Isis. And he has found and a way to actually take a Twitter account away from, and this goes to brainwashing because they use Twitter and their websites to indoctrinate not just Middle Eastern jihadi fighters, but people particularly in the West. So those young impressionable minds that they have been convincing to go to the Middle East to fight their jihad, a lot of them are being recruited on Twitter. He's found a way to take over a Twitter account and glean from that account all sorts of valuable, really data-rich intelligence. He's taking that information as ghosts do, and he's a former member of GhostSec, which we've talked a lot about on the two shows that we've done together. He's taking that information and turning it over to um, governments or posting it online so that it's, it's available. And the governments that he's he's working with, he's keeping uh, confidential so that the terrorists don't know, you know, which governments have control or have are directly receiving this information. But he is putting the information on the internet for everyone to see, and his timeline. It's fun. it's actually fun if you are um, an anti ISIS type of person, you will get the biggest kick out of looking down his timeline. So we're going to do two things. You and I are going to do a short podcast of for whom the tip bell tolls podcast. 
on this activity and what he's doing. We are going to put his Twitter handle in the description for our show. And we're going to talk more about it on that podcast and um, read some of the tweets that he's put out there. But he does it... um, He does everything with the sense of humor. He does this with the sense of humor. And it's really fun to watch him take control of a Twitter account and talk about what he's doing with it. And you can actually see him chase these guys around Twitter. And it is a ton of fun to watch. But the intelligence that he's getting from these Twitter accounts when he takes them over is more than fun. It is it, it, it's a wonderful thing to watch. So we want everybody to know about that. We're going to do a separate podcast on it and make that available for everybody. And we'll be tuning it out. We'll make it available for you guys. It's going to be great. I, you know what? I think that's a great idea. Very exciting uh, that you're keeping up with this uh, sort of in the clandestine mold because you know I love cyber warfare. <laughs> well, and it'll be it'll be not only entertaining. Uh, and let's, let's, are you going to try to get him on to uh, be part of that? Yeah, we're going to see if he wants to do an interview. I've done a, um, I, I've done some some interviewing back and forth um, with him offline, but we're going to we're going to invite him on. And, and if he has opportunity and he wants to do that, he certainly will have the opportunity to. But but we'll see if we can get him on the air. Uh, the great that'll be a great show, and uh, hopefully we can reach people uh, as long as our minds aren't closed and. Uh, educate them yeah anybody that watches this going on they'd have to have a very closed mind not to at least get a kick out of it (laughs) well well that being said there's lots of news from last week and uh, some of the not all of a couple things were covered in uh, bloody mirrors and broad sheets today by jd and i call him juju by the way jd i call him juju bad juju yeah he's Uh, gonna hurt you and the cornell shit and the (laughs) stacy but let's kind of see what we can get through here um this has been in the news a lot lately. L, and you taught me something I didn't know. Uh, it's LGBTQ. I didn't know that. LGBTQ yeah. men that self-identify as a, as a woman, female. In 16 states now, they can use the same public toilet as my daughters, as, as, as America's little girls go in and use when it's time for them to go use the bathroom. These LGBTQ men who simply self-identify as a female will be in the same public toilet as our little girls. I, I'm just totally disgusted by that. Something that, that happened on this, whole, this same front from the home state there of North Carolina, the commissioner of the NBA Basketball League, is threatening to relocate next All-Star game away from the city of Charlotte if North Carolina does not rescind its so-called anti-LGBT uh, law. Well, we'll see if that works or not because the um, the owner of the team in Charlotte is actually Michael Jordan. So we'll see if that's actually going to happen with that NBA, that former NBA star particularly being one of the owners of that team. And the other thing is that the sponsor for the stadium there, the arena there, I believe is Bank of America. So, yeah, yeah we'll see if that actually happens. And, and Bank of America's global headquarters is actually Charlotte, North Carolina. So so we'll see about that, actually. I, um, I, I'll I believe I that. Don't. I'll believe that when I see it. But... You know, the interesting thing to me, Dr. Arrington, is that I have seen from the people that are upset about this issue, it's mostly fathers, even more so than mothers. So mothers are upset. Fathers are vehemently upset. They're livid about it. I remember when I first moved to New Orleans and I had a young daughter. And the first time I took her and my uh, son, who was a little bit older than her, to a Saints game at the Superdome, she said, Daddy, I have to go to the bathroom. So, okay, so I walked her up there. She was old enough that I didn't want to take her to the men's room. And so I let her go into the, the, the ladies' room there at this football stadium. As soon as I lost sight of her, I got very nervous mm-hmm. for my daughter. Oh, my goodness. I, I didn't like it. Can yeah. you imagine Can you imagine if I'm in North Carolina and I, I had a baby, maybe a grandchild, I w- let her go in the girls' room. I-, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Well, if you were in North you know, Carolina, you'd be fine because we have the law that protects. Well, them. yeah, okay. You know this this LGBT 
Q population in America, Lou, is 0.03% of the population. Yeah. But it seems like right now, because of these uh, cultural Marxists out there, they are controlling public policy in several cities, states, and businesses. An example would be Target. Just uh, said they're going to allow you to go to any, any restroom you want. You know, this and is an example of what Dr. Brody at UCLA taught me uh, several years ago when I was undergraduate at UCLA. This is an example of minorities rule. Locke not, not, predicted it. Yeah, not majority rule. This is the tyranny of the minority. minority. And, and Locke predicted it. And don't mention the show that we're going to do. I, I, well, I won't. But the, the <laughs> lefties, when I say lefties, think progressive communists. They want to stifle all discussion. Anything that disagrees with their desired reality for America. Lou, what the heck, I toned that down, what the heck has happened to the United States of America? My beloved country that I fought for for 31 years so that you could be free in this country. What has happened to Well, I mean, if you're seriously asking me the question and it's not rhetorical, I would say two basic things. Those people that, that the progressives and, you know, these days progressive and communist is, an, it, it, it's redundant, but those progressives have convinced us that, um, number one, the Constitution is a living document, and number two, that certain things are rights that aren't at all rights. You have no you know, right to choose which restroom that you have, and by doing it, you take away the fundamental rights of someone else if you do. So if you have a right to choose which restroom you use, then I have the right to choose which restroom I use. And by a man entering the women's restroom that I choose to use because it's a women's restroom, it's no longer a women's restroom. Right. Your favorite president, Obama, his administration is currently suing a school because they will not allow a teenage boy to use the girl's bathroom, the girl's locker room, and actually shower in the girl's shower. They're suing. Are they that stupid? Well, again, also, I live in North Carolina. If you want me to be surprised about the federal government suing anyone, you need to talk to somebody in another state because I think there's like six different laws of ours that they sued us over. They made us move our primary just for our representatives. So while we primaried every other election in the state, our state representatives have to have a primary in June, and they had eight weeks to campaign for it. So they had to register, announce, well, and, and they did it in the separate order because of, of the filing dates. We're so close to the election date. So they announced, right. they filed, and they have to be primaried within eight weeks. We, we've got a, uh, believe it or not, folks, we have a brand new psychological diagnosis that has been created by these so-called wordsmith thinkers. It is called gender identity disorder. A six-year-old boy in Colorado has been diagnosed with gender identity disorder, and they won a lawsuit allowing him to be able to use the girls' bathroom at that school. You know what, Lou? What will these so-called educated wordsmiths in psychology think of next? What will they conjure up next? Uh, Harvard admissions rejection syndrome, <laughs> Beverly Beverly Hills home ownership economic and capability disorder, last place finish but give them a trophy anyway psychological salve as a prescription, and and you know it's funny you laugh at that but there's a group of mega liberal Harvard educated lawyers uh, and current Harvard uh, faculty members who just two weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, they want educational justice or opportunity justice. They are lobbying for free Harvard education for black students. Why? Because of past discrimination and a history of, here it goes, folks, white privilege and financial prejudice and discrimination at Harvard. I want to go to Harvard, but I don't have the money to do that. I wouldn't go to Harvard if you paid my tuition. Well, I'd go walk the grounds and see what it looks like. But, you know, Great Britain are still our number one our number one friends, along with Israel. 
But because of who's in the White House and his antagonistic view, he, the first thing he did when he got in the White House, you know what he did? He sent back the bust of Winston Churchill. Yeah. What an idiot. Great Britain just issued a travel advisory to its citizens, warning them about visiting North Carolina, your home state right now, and Mississippi. Listen, folks, trust Dr. Ray on this one subject. Obama and the communist progressives have fundamentally transformed the United States of America. Freedom of religion and freedom of speech have been successfully compromised in the United States of America, and the rest of the world knows it. Our founding principles are being tossed into the dustbin of history. And if the useful idiots, the mind-raped morons, put Mrs. Clinton into the White House for the next eight years, the United States of America will not survive. We will collapse and cease to exist as a free nation, throwing America and the entire world into utter chaos, folks. Trust me on that one subject. Absolutely. And we're that's a wrap, Doc. And I think you ended on a on a pretty good note. So we enjoyed well, having you. We'll be back next week. You can catch us Tuesdays at 5 p.m. on WNJC 1360 in Philly. It's part of the Conservative Commando Radio Network. Thursday nights at 8 p.m. on K98talk.org. Say goodbye, Doc. Goodbye. Let freedom ring. God help us and speak the truth. Endure the consequences. So long, everybody. Have a great week. If you want to work until you keel over, have less of everything in retirement, or give back more of your hard-earned money to the stock market again, then just ignore me. But if you'd like to protect the money you save, receive a steady, predictable retirement income, and enjoy financial security for as long as you live, then listen to this. You can download a free report that reveals the wealth-building secrets Wall Street and the banks don't want you to know. You'll learn how you can get guaranteed growth, safety, and real prosperity without risking your money in the Wall Street Casino and how to get the money you need when you need it simply by asking for it. This is the best way to have a 100% secure retirement and know your money will last as long as you do. To learn more about this method and to get your free report, go to 29security.com. That's the number 29security.com. 29security.com. Go to 29security.com.